Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the ACES sort of final event of uh, PEDUM, which is Asian Pacific Islander Daisy American Heritage Month. My name is Dr. Nina Ha, and I'm the director of the Asian Cultural Engagement Center here at Virginia Tech. Um, before I totally begin, I'd like to recite the land and labor acknowledgement. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monaghan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous students, staff, and faculty, recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize the enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to UTPROSUM that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce EJ and Charlene, who have coordinated and put this um, panel together of amazing um, alumni. So leave it to you. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Elaine or EJ. Uh, either is fine. Um, I'm the membership chair of the PETA's organization. Uh, thank you for taking your time out of your busy week to join us for this career panel. I hope you all are looking forward to learning about each of our panelists as much as we are. And just a quick reminder, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And in case you haven't been to any of our events before, Charlene, Jackie, Jackie, Melanie, and myself are board members of the Asian Pacific Islander Desi Alumni Society, APITAS, at Virginia Tech. And this org has been around for three years now. Uh, the panel is a part of our annual programming. Other events we host throughout the year are the Homecoming Alumni Tailgate, Alumni Happy Hours, and the Achievement Ceremony. Um, we also often collaborate with the Asian American Student Union, the Asian Cultural Engagement Center, and other alumni, alumni groups. And if you have any questions about this alumni society, please stick around until the end and we'll share with you all how to stay connected. So, I'm seeing that we have some people joining in the in the webinar. Um, I think we're ready to just begin. So Charlene, do you want to introduce our panelists? Sure. Okay, so tonight we have a diverse panel who are in different stages in their career and have expertise in different fields. So first I'm going to introduce uh, Rudy Contelacion. Uh, Rudy graduated in 1988 with a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He has 34 years of experience in the tire industry, including positions at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and Kumo Tire. He currently works at the Tire and Rim Association and is also serving as the U.S. Technical Advisory Group Administrator for ISO Te Technical Committee 31, whose scope is to standardize tires, rims, and valves. Next, we have Kevin Dung, who graduated in 2017 with a Bachelor's of Science in Human Nutrition, Food, and Exercise. At Virginia Tech, he served as president of the Vietnamese Student Association. He now works as an occupational therapist at Fox Rehabilitation, working with seniors in their homes. And last but not least, we have Chris Tu. He graduated in 2020 with a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Engineering and Business Management. He works as a senior security engineer and also does freelance as a photographer and videographer. His freelance work specializes in lifestyle, landscape, and sports photography. He has a broad skill set with his experience in both technical and creative businesses. Now that I've introduced our wonderful panelists, I'd like to start our discussion. I want to remind you that since this is a discussion, please feel free to chime in and piggyback off one another's answers whenever you please. Elaine and I have prepared 10 questions. So starting off with our first question, we would like to know, where did you grow up and where are you working or residing currently? Um, let's start with Rudy. Would you like to start? 
Sure. So, you know, being the son of a uh, U.S. Navy sailor, I uh, grew up in Norfolk and Virginia Beach. Uh, didn't get a, uh, an opportunity to move around a lot. I think we just kind of settled in that area. And then uh, I currently work at the Tire and Room Association as the executive vice president in, in Akron, Ohio. And I ended up in Akron graduating from Virginia Tech and hiring right into Goodyear. Uh, Goodyear was one of uh, their top 10 target schools for engineering. So that's what led me to uh, Akron. Thank you. Nice. Kevin, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Kevin. Um, I'm born and raised in Northern Virginia. Um, grew up there, went to high school there, and then went to Virginia Tech. Um, afterwards, had a little bit of a detour in Philly where um, I went to graduate school. And um, we're back in Northern Virginia now, um, working. And um, right now, my job is to go into my clients' homes um, around the McLean, Tyson's, um, Dunloring area. If you guys are familiar, it's um, close to the mall up here. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm up to nowadays. Cool. And Chris? All right. What's up? So I'm Chris, um, class of 2020 from Tech, uh, IEO was born and raised in LaGrange, Texas, a small town hidden in the foothills of outside of Austin, Texas. Um, and I actually am a transfer student to tech. So I started my college career at the University of Texas at Austin, born and raised a Longhorn. And then um, halfway through college, I transferred to Virginia Tech. And actually I'm currently a digital nomad. Um, I don't live anywhere permanently at the moment. I don't have a lease signed anywhere. Um, but you can usually find me between four states, which is Virginia, Texas, Utah, or Hawaii. So, yeah. Very cool. Oh, I guess moving on to our next question, like now that we know like where you've come from and where you are now, I, we're wondering like, how did you guys end up at Virginia Tech or how did you find out about tech too? Um, I guess we'll start with Kevin. You can go first. Sure. Um, so as a senior in um, high school, um, just a little bit of background, I was very into um, art and photography in high school. Originally had um, signed on to go to tech to be an industrial design student. Um, came here, um, you know, I guess I didn't have like the adequate uh, mentoring at the time, but didn't feel like it was the right fit for me. Um, so swapped out industrial design and then um, kind of, uh, dipped my foot a little bit into biology, wasn't really quite what I wanted, and then I found h and FE, and I found like that was a little, a little bit my footing, um, but yeah, that's how I found Virginia Tech, and um, during my time here, I was the historian for uh, VTVSA, and then also the president when I was a senior. Um, still keep up with tech all the time, um, laugh, cry at all the football games, so um, hopefully if we're all ever in Blacksburg, uh, you know, maybe we can meet up Tots and I'll buy you guys a beer or something. I admit, I'm curious how my uncle Rudy, how did you end up at Tech? Yeah, I was, uh, you know, growing up, I was always interested in cars and, you know, working on cars. And in my senior year in high school, my parents enrolled me in a automotive training uh, institute. That's where I it's really received my formal education on automotive repair. And that kind of piqued my curiosity. Well, okay, now how cars work. It's like, how are they designed? So it was actually your uh, grandmother kind of pointed me in the direction of mechanical engineering because that pretty much uh, applied to everything automotive. So that's, uh, I mean, I looked at a couple other schools and plus your uh, father was already going there. So I decided, oh, hell, I'll just uh, be able to hang out with my brother for another couple of years and, uh, and study. So that's how I ended up at Virginia Tech. I would have tried to stay far away from my brother. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. That, that's the first time I've heard this. So I, I think that was really cool. So. Moving on to Chris, how'd you find out about tech? I know you said you're a transfer student, but like how you were all the way in Texas. Like, how did you find out about tech? So my family moved to Virginia and I was 
moving and transferring schools just so I can stay in state, um, like tuition wise, because if I would have stayed in Texas, I would have been charged out of state. Um, so uh, the reason why I found about, out about tech was because it's one of the two big state schools, um, the other one being uh, UVA. And, um, but I know they're the number one ranked in engineering program in the state of Virginia. And then that's the, that's how I found out about tech. But before that, I only knew it because of VT football. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, um, and then I did some more research um, during my transfer process and seeing, you know, what would probably be the best school to transfer to as an engineering student. So tech was kind of a no brainer here in the state of Virginia. And yeah, uh, ended up here fall of 2018. Ooh, I was also a transfer student. So I chose tech because I really like the community there. <laughs> The community, the environment, there's lots of stuff to do there. Mountains, very pretty. Where'd you transfer? Um, I transferred, well, I went to community college first. So I transferred from the Northern Virginia Community College. Okay, gotcha. You got your associates, I'm assuming, and then? Yep, the, okay. whole, the whole thing. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question, I guess, related to Virginia Tech on our topic, okay. How did you get involved at Virginia Tech? Um, what was your experience at Virginia Tech and how did it prepare you for the industry that you're in? You want to move on popcorn off? Maybe Chris? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll go off, I guess, since I'm the most recent uh, alum. Um, so I got involved at Virginia Tech in a multitude of organizations. I was involved in VSA, CAS. Um, I was involved in Greek life. So I was a former Sigma Chi at UT Austin, transfer to the chapter at Virginia Tech. And then uh, I start. I founded the Photography Club here at Virginia Tech, and then VT Spark, which is also another creative club that specializes specializes in uh, a lot of more artwork and video outside of photography. And then my experiences at VT really shaped me into the two industries that I predominantly work in, which is cybersecurity, um, which is in the tech industry, along with photography and videography. Um, I would say a huge chunk of my professional, I guess you say full-time career could be attested to my mentors in computer engineering. One of them is Thomas Liu. He's an alum from 2019. He was also studying computer engineering and he also did transfer. Um, and so he gave me a lot of guidance into the program. And then my, my professor um, in the computer engineering program really helped me out, mentoring me, going to see what career path I wanted to find within computer engineering and in the tech industry. That's how I ended up in cybersecurity was because of him. And then starting those clubs and finding those clubs at tech. So the photography club and Spark really propelled me into, you know, being a creative um, journeyman, you know, just doing whatever I want and the creative uh, arts. And I know that's traditionally not something that I guess you'd say a lot of Asian parents would want, but it was very freeing and it was something that I could get away from engineering with because engineering is, is very left brain, very analytical. Um, the photography and videography really let me flex my creative muscles. And through that, I was able to meet many creative people at tech who ultimately kind of recommended me to get a lot of these creative side jobs and gigs through um, which, which utilize both photography and videography. And yeah, that's a quick summary about it. Very cool. It's very cool that you do both technical and creative. You know, you're all, you always find someone who does one or the other, but never both. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, Rudy, would you like to go? So my, you know, being an engineering student, it was hard enough just trying to learn everything and get good grades. But uh, I was involved with the Society of Automotive Engineers uh, chapter at Virginia Tech. And my senior year, I uh, I was interested in, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Formula Baja program where they build this off-road uh, vehicle, but I was more interested in, say, you know, Formula One racing, you know, sports car racing. So I decided to uh, start the Formula SAE program. So I was uh, credited my senior year with actually beginning that program reaching out to different companies and finding the funding to do it and also trying to get 
the right group of guys together to design and build the car. And it was, um, you know, at the time, I didn't really know it, but, you know, it was critical to learn team, working with the team. And I've used that um, pretty much uh, throughout my career and uh, even today. So it's, uh, it's a really great experience. No, that's really cool. Both of those clubs are actually really big at Virginia Tech. I remember I wanted to switch to mechanical engineering just because I thought those clubs were so cool. <laughs> yeah, I remember like our mechanical engineering classmates, they were competing to get yeah, in. Yeah, it's very competitive yeah. like club to get into now. Yeah, oh, but I think uh, it's going to senior design now. Can't remember. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because you know, when we started, it was just uh, we got this uh, guy from Vietnam, Koi Ta who was, uh, you know, escaped the war there when he was a, a child. So he he was into motorcycles and uh, he was kind of a crazy rider. He ended up having some destroyed bikes. So he, he had a spare motor and donated for the program. And then I remember our first meeting, there was a, a young guy sitting there who was a, in the computer science program. And I asked, okay, well, anyone know how to design a chassis? And he raised his hand and he said, yeah, I, I wrote a program to design the chassis and the suspension for my father's uh, SCCA A-Mod car. So uh, his name was Todd Boland and he ended up, I think he's still working in the NASCAR arena, but you know, he worked in IndyCar and, and NASCAR. So he's a, he was a pretty sharp guy and I was really fortunate to have him on the team you know, as a freshman. So he obviously carried uh, the team all the way through uh, his um, graduate studies. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. Glad, glad to hear everything's going well. Yeah, Melanie definitely. actually commented that she was involved in, was it, sorry, I, I admit I'm not savvy with, with the mechanical engineering world, but she said, I was in Baja while Formula <laughs> SAE is a huge design team at VT now. So that's what she said in the comments. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think we had, uh, there were eight of us at the time, the first year. We almost won, but we broke in the durability test. Well, y'all cool. come a long way now. Yeah. Sorry, Charlene, I took over. Go ahead. Wait, Rudy, would you have any pictures? It'd be really cool if you could send me some pictures. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might have some uh, of the original car. Yeah, I'll, nice. uh, I'll look that up and send that to you. Great. <laughs> All right, Kevin, you said you were uh, the president of the of VSA. Um, were you involved in anything else at Virginia Tech? How was your experience and how did you think it prepared you for your industry? Yeah, sure. Um, so like I said, I was a VSA president when I was a senior. Um, in addition to being in VSA, um, also, you know, came out to a couple of things for CAS, FASA. Um, the crazy part about um, my first job actually out of um, graduate school was my mentor um, at my first job was a, a member of FASA um, 12 years ago. And then so we worked in um, a company that was mainly Caucasian women. And, you know, they paired me up with like the one other Asian person there. And I was like, dang, what are the odds that, you know, she's also hokey, wasn't FASA. So, you know, she knows the deal. Um, but anyways, I think, um, you know, my experiences at Virginia Tech, you know, being in the, um, you know, part of the, all the Asian orgs that they had to offer, um, you know, came out supported, especially when you were present, you know, you want to show support for, you know, your other comrades, um, you know, bring out your people, they bring out their people, um, really wanted to be a hooky ambassador when I was a freshman, didn't work out, uh, probably was for the better. <laughs> um, I also tried out a little bit of SGA, um, but then, you know, I... I wanted to do student government because I was, you know, in student government in high school, but then kind of just transitioned full time to doing stuff for BSA. And um, really, I think uh, the biggest thing that shaped my experiences um, so far, you know, in my career um, was that as a student at Virginia Tech and, you know, being in BSA, being an officer, being all those things is that you work with a variety of people um, on a day to day basis. And then so um, as an occupational therapist, I can explain this a little bit further um, later in the uh, in the seminar, um, but being a therapist, you really adapt the way um, you work with your clients um, based on, you know, what they need, um, you know, what they're looking for, what their personalities are, and kind of like, um, you know, being an officer back in these like clubs, 
Um, when you work with the folks around you, you have to know, you know, how can I bring out the best in them? Um, and then, you know, how do I help strengthen the areas that um, they need to? And then not just that, but um, learn to be a little bit of um, adaptable, um, you know, knowing kind of, you know, I, I'm not going to say, you know, um, the imposter syndrome, but, you know, I like to say growth, um, the growth mindset, um, because sometimes when you're uncomfortable and, you know, you can kind of think, ah, uh, you know, like, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? But then I think surrounding myself with people, not just people who want to say yes, because, you know, I was a president and they want to say yes to everything I want to, but um, being able to understand other people's opinions and, you know, why they um, are telling you something a certain way, because once you get into the workforce, you know, once you work with, um, you know, I work with other physical therapists, I work with doctors, um, family members, patients, you know, I've, I've worked with people from start of life to end to life, end of life. Um, so, you know, I think being around a variety of people back in tech um, really shaped me um, into being able to kind of, you know, being adaptable to all the different personalities, what they have to say, and you know, not just what they have to say, but why um, they did. Um, yeah, sorry, long answer. No, that's great. Sounds like you have to be very flexible in your job. <laughs> um, EJ, would you like to ask the next question? Yes, my bad. Um, <laughs> shifting a little bit, of, I guess like to reminisce more about tech, like what was your favorite part or favorite memory about Virginia Tech? Oh shoot, yes, I have to pick one of you. Um, Chris, I haven't chosen you yet to go first. Okay, yeah, sure. So favorite memory, um, it would probably be a mix between just hanging out with friends, but um, what, but outside of tech, like we would hang out and take off, so going to the football games together, going to BSA events, going to get, and going downtown and other school activities. But going beyond that, a lot of them, um, I ended up traveling with them around the world. A lot of members of the Asian community there um, went to like Europe, Asia with them, um, the Caribbean. And um, those are probably some of my favorite memories just because it wasn't about like the destination, but the whole journey, the way how I came in as, you know, a transfer student had knew, didn't know a single soul at Tech when I came here. Um, and I'm not even a Virginia native. The whole process of it, the making new friends, new connections, truly from the ground up, you know, that was probably one of my favorite parts at Tech. Wait, yeah. that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think I left the country or the state at all. Like while I was at Tech, so it's really cool you got to do all that while at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like a like zero to hero moment. Um, mm -hmm. just like. I had I had no one to fall back on, just myself. So it was also a huge learning process, which really pays up, paid off later in life. But at the time, you know, I had like tunnel vision. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. But you know, it was like a huge risky uh, thing to do. Transfer schools, especially from a school you're comfortable with, to something out of state and something completely different. Um, but it it was worthwhile for me. Um, and yeah, those memories I really cherish a lot. And it, it's made me who I am today and like really changed my worldview on like how I perceive the world around us and how I kind of like um, approach problems in life. So yeah. Yeah, I just realized actually like each of you, like I know Chris, you graduated 2020, but like each of you got to experience college almost like fully without the pandemic. So yeah, I think that's really interesting that like, I know you guys have the rest of you haven't answered yet, but it's just like the idea that like, yeah, your like your memories are, I guess, untouched by like by that. So I think that's really cool that you actually you got to travel the world before like all of that went down. But yeah, sorry, I just remembered that. But yeah, um, Uncle Rudy, would you like to go next? Sure. So outside the Formula SAE program we were talking about earlier, I just love going to the football games. Um, you know, starting the cup stacks and getting beer thrown at you. Um, that was probably my favorite part outside of classes. So other than, you know, obviously the, the scenery just around Blacksburg exploring was uh, really amazing. You know, we you guys are lucky to uh, have that around the university. Yeah, I feel like 
me personally, I was more inclined to become a little more granola because of Virginia Tech and all the hiking and all the greenery. So yeah, I'd say like other than hanging out with friends, like I agree, like yeah. just being around everything over there. Yeah, Kevin, I'm sorry, we keep putting you at last, like, go ahead. <laughs> No, don't worry about it. I was trying to, I was trying, I had a picture with like Bud Foster from like a football game like two years ago. I was like in line, like getting like a beer when they finally, you know, they start, they start selling beer at like Lane Stadium. But then like I see this old dude next to me that smells like cologne. And I like turn, I'm like, Bud Foster? Um, but anyways, sorry, Rudy. I was, trying, I was trying to pull that up to show you guys because you yeah, had mentioned football. Um, gosh, yeah, my favorite memories of Virginia Tech. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of like name like two. My, I think one of the most memorable parts of college was um, our VSA culture show my senior year um, because not just because it's like the culture show, you know, it's kind of like the end of the year. Everyone's like happy, big last project um, as being like part of like the org before, you know, everyone goes off the finals and all that. Um, but just I think the way that um, I felt just kind of wrapped up my college career and my time um, being in the VSA, um, it was a little surreal because um, you know, by the time I was a senior, I felt like, you know, I had like close group of friends like uh, in VSA and in the Asian community. Um, not just that, but then uh, my friends from back home from my high school came down for like the first time to like see me and stuff. Um, so it was like super cool. Um, and not just that, but with like culture shows, there's like a lot of rehearsals, you know, you want to get everything done right. And uh, we were kind of freaking out because I think we had only gone over the show like one time or something. And then, um, you know, I don't know, I don't think people say yellow anymore, but we're kind of like, well, you know what, let's just, let's just do it, man. And then um, everything worked out and, you know, it was just, I think it was just a nice bow on top of everything, um, 10 senior year and then to kind of transition away from college. My, se my second memory, and this isn't one of my favorites, but I think this is one of uh, my most memorable is uh, Melanie might be able to tell you about this. When she was a freshman, um, we did this thing, I called it the, the, the Kevin turns. So it was basically like freshmen, and then we took them um, to kind of shadow like officers, see what they did. And then so one time I took them to the VSA storage. And if you guys are, um, I don't know if you guys know, but there's a storage facility in Christiansburg. Um, it's on top of like a gravel hill. It's the most like suspicious thing ever. Um, it's like, it looks like a horror movie. But anyways, um, Melanie and the other people, the other kids, you guys know like Kevin Nguyen and like Jeannie Lamb and uh, Mackie Ann, like they're all with me. And um, I didn't tell them that I was like in some scary place in Christiansburg. I was like, hey, like, let's just go like return the stuff to from Culture Show. And then they're all like, freaked out. Um, and they're like, oh, my gosh, like, I can't believe like you guys have to do this all the time. But the reason why that's one of my favorite memories is because of what all those people in the group uh, wound up doing. Um, like years later, I mean, after Kevin and Melanie graduated college, right, um, all meet you know, some some students from like Virginia Tech, you know, whether they're seniors, juniors, whatever. Um, and then they'll kind of ask me about VSA and they're like, yeah, man, like Melanie and Kevin, like they're such like old heads and, you know, um, they're so nice people. I'm like, man, I remember when they were freshmen. So, and I think that it just kind of speaks to, you know, if you um, kind of, you know, if you see the potential in people um, kind of bring out the best in their potential. And then, you know, I'm happy to see that Melanie still to this day um, is involved in so many different clubs and I even remember back then Melanie was in like 10 different clubs and I think I saw her calendar one time and I was like man how are you like president vice president of like 10 different things um, but yeah so that's one of my favorite times at, um, at Tech. No I agree like the relationships you formed there are really special like I would like Charlene, Melanie, and Jackie like if you told me like as a freshman that I would like keep friends this long I would be really surprised like but yeah so no I, I understand what you're saying yeah. yeah definitely miss the community in Virginia Tech like everyone there is at the same stage of life everyone's either in college or professor but the professors live like you know farther away but you can just walk around just talk to anybody because everyone's so open to talking and meeting people yeah it's great <laughs> town mentality yeah, and the walkability of everything. Like I live in Virginia Beach now. I can't walk anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I can drive somewhere to walk along the beach, but it's very different, very different vibes. Um, okay, so since you guys are in different phases in your career, it'd be interesting to see the spectrum of insight you guys can give current students. 
So starting off with someone fairly new in the field, um, Chris, what insight can you provide as someone who's about two years in your industry? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak on both industries that I'm currently in. Mm -hmm. uh, fail a lot. You will fail like anything in life, but fail fast. Um, it's the ultimate teacher in life. Um, I've made so many mistakes going in cybersecurity and the industry. You know, I've played around with like viruses and malware analysis on it. I've accidentally like destroyed computers because I didn't do this one thing right on the computer. So the virus took it over, um, had like some malicious um, phishing emails come through and I didn't build out the rule or the dashboard correctly to catch it. But I learned fast um, and anything in life, you know, you will fail and it's the ultimate teacher. And same thing with um, the creative aspect. And I will say in the creative industry, everyone's always eyeing for the perfect photo. But I will say this, um, numbers speak more than quality, um, quantity over quality in the creative industry. You have to be constantly practicing both shooting photos and video. You always have to be constantly shooting every day. That's how I learned very quickly. I only picked up a camera actually about four, four to five years ago when I transferred to tech. And in that short time, you know, I did anything I could every day to practice photography and videography, just shooting for friends, shooting at VSA events, and built up my portfolio. I did fail a lot. Uh, I didn't know how to like adjust certain settings, shutter, ISO, aperture. But in due time, you know, you learn and things compound quickly. And from there, you know, the fruits of your labor will truly blossom. I currently now recently, like super recently became a senior engineer at my firm. And then I just kept off shooting for BMW over in Germany last month. So um, I will say you fail a lot and learn how to fail efficiently though, and very quickly. So you can learn and propel yourself later on. And yeah, that's probably my biggest advice to uh, anyone who's super recent graduating from college, going into any industry. No, I completely agree. I feel like we don't really hear about people's failure stories. We only see people who are who have been in our industry for a really long time, don't really know how they started, but you know, they started in our shoes, you know. You yeah, come well, out of college, you think you know everything, you, you're humbled. You're humbled quickly. <laughs> but you'll learn and you know, you get better at your job, you know, through experience, you know. No one's going to be really good right out of college and then stay really good through the rest of their life. Like you're just going to get better and better. It's just how it works. Very mm -hmm. cool. Um, actually, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was actually wondering where you were going when you said quantity over quality. I was like, that's a new one. And then I understood what you meant. So I, I really like that. That's a hot take. Yeah, it is a huge hot take. You, um, Everyone always thinks, you know, you have to, you can see studies in photography class. It was a study done by Stanford where he assigned, uh, it was a hundred person class, 50 students, um, were given the assignment, can you give me one good photo by the end of the semester? And the other 50 students were given the assignment of, can you give me 100 photos, good photos that you think that are good by the end of the semester? And showing the photos to the panel, overwhelmingly majority, the students who had to shoot more took the better photos compared to the students who only did everything they can to perfect that one shot. Um, it's an industry that is really populated or very it really rewards people who put in a lot of quantity and effort in that way. So, yeah. Gotcha. I'm inspired. Thank you. Yeah. And then, Thank you, Chris. Yeah. And then moving on to Kevin, um, what insight can you provide as someone who's invested over five years into your industry? I think um, one of the biggest uh, and best pieces of advice I got early on in my career was um, to ask for what you need and to not be afraid to ask for help. Um, I think that, you know, when you start a new job or maybe like fresh out of college, um, there's a little bit of pride involved, um, you know, um, going from, you know, kind of feeling you're very confident in something and then kind of, and kind of like what Charlene said, right, you get humbled real quick. Um, but I think as long as you are willing to be honest with yourself and, um, you know, be true to yourself too, um, 
I've always felt like uh, I've always succeeded well when I've had a good mentor, someone to kind of lean on, um, you know, especially to bounce ideas off of, you know, when I'm struggling, um, they can kind of, you know, help me navigate through those um, uh, tougher times. Um, and I think just also in a field like healthcare, um, you will be asked a lot of questions um, on, you know, from a variety of things, right? Like um, I have people asking me, um, am I going to be okay? Um, will I ever be able to walk again? Um, back when I was walking with children, you would say, you know, is my son ever going to be better? Is my daughter going to ever be better? And, you know, a lot of times you have to tell them, you know, what you really think, um, because you don't want to, I mean, yeah, this obviously there's a couple of worse case, you know, tougher situations to be in. Um, but then you don't want to sugarcoat anything that you don't really um, honestly believe in. And then there are things that you honestly believe in, and then you can kind of, you know, articulate like why this and why that. So I think just being true to yourself. And then if they ask you a question that, you know, you don't quite know, you don't have to act like you know it because what ends up happening. And this happened to me a couple of times too, where you just kind of ramble on and they, I mean, they can kind of pick it up that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so I think if you don't know something, it's okay to just say, you know, I'm not the subject matter expert on the topic. Um, let me ask somebody else. Let me get you the best information because you, um, you as a client, when you ask um, somebody, you know, in an industry, you know, it could be, um, it's like Rudy may, you know, someone wants to get the car fixed, right? You gotta be the subject matter expert and tell them, what do you think? Like Chris, you know, what do you honestly think, you know, what I need to do? Um, you want to give them the honest answer and you want to be sure that um if you don't know what you're doing or if you're unsure that you direct them um into the right path um but yeah so just don't be afraid to tell don't be afraid to tell the truth i think is um my biggest advice absolutely <laughs> um okay Rudy, what insight can you provide as someone who's invested over 30 years in your industry where do you feel like you're at in the spectrum I've, I made a list and it's probably 10 items long, but, you know, I want to kind of follow up and support what Kevin said. I mean, it, it's don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, being in the, I guess, science and technical industry, it's, you know, you may think you're the smartest engineer, but if you come across a problem, chances are someone has seen it before. So, you know, save the time save your ego and just just ask someone have you seen this before why is this doing this and uh you know you'll you'll learn faster and you'll probably have more respect with your peers as well um and and that uh kind of prompted me to uh, remember a story so I, when i was working at kumo we had this um it guy working for us and he was looking to find another job and then during my um, racing, you know, me personally racing, I met a guy that uh, was pretty high up in SunTrust banks at the time. He was, a, I'm going to call him a chief technical officer, but he was uh, in charge of all the computers and he was looking to hire somebody. So I recommended this guy uh, that I was working with at Kumo and he went down to uh, interview and they were interviewing a couple of candidates. and then. Um, afterwards, my buddy at SunTrust said, we're going to hire Jermaine. I go, oh, you are? Well, why is that? Because, you know, we asked one specific question to all the candidates. Okay, you're in the server room. Something has crashed. Um, we're losing $100,000 an hour. What do you do? And my buddy was the only one to answer, oh, I just asked somebody around and see if they've have seen this problem before. So, you know, again, don't be afraid to help, ask for help. Um, another uh, point is, you know, be a sponge. Just learn as much as you can, not, not just within your you know, work discipline, but outside. You know, if you're interested in learning how to cook or, or weld or, you know, anything, uh, do it because, you know, life's short and you can probably apply what you learn in things you do outside of work to, to your job. And, uh, and learn how to listen. When I was uh, starting at Goodyear, they had a lot of um, classes they would offer to the employees to 
help grow you. And one of them was the business of listening. And it was um, really eye-opening, but it, even though it was a listening class and, and how to listen and, you know, don't be the, the only person talking in the room. Sometimes it's better to be quiet and just hear from everyone, you know, before you uh, offer up an opinion. So I think that's, uh, it's pretty key, especially when you're like in my job now, working with uh, international standards, you know, getting to meet with other countries or people from other countries, and you learn how to uh, collaborate and and listen to to other others' opinions and try to kind of get a consensus. So that's uh, those are pretty important. I agree. I have asked so many questions to my manager. He probably is so sick of me, but it's the only way to learn. Like, yeah, yeah you don't bad. know what I you like, don't know. <laughs> I like being the dumb guy in the room. You know, I don't want to be the smartest person. Yeah, humble. <laughs> okay, EJ, would you like to ask the next question? Okay, so I guess the reason why we're asking this next question is because um, I guess like uh, the idea of company uh, culture quiet quitting like that's some those are some buzzwords that are like something that's always popping up now um so I guess like the idea of a career right it's it's also changing what advice do you have on navigating that burnout that a lot of um people are like are more vocal about now Is, did anyone want to start with it and no, I can I can definitely choose I can start it off because I'm uh, I'm feeling it right now with my current workload. So currently right now, I'm actually back at Virginia Tech shooting graduation photos for the class of 2023, but I'm still working full time. So um, I work remotely, which is the reason why I'm able to. But currently right now, I'm putting in about 110 hours a week of combined uh, work between photography and my full time. So I work nine to five. I have a nine to five, 40 hour work week job. But then outside of that, from five till sunset, I'm photographing the graduates. And then from after sunset until around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I'm editing photos only to get up again at around 7 a.m., 6.30 to shoot more grads at sunrise. Try to get some breakfast and a quick nap again. And then I do it all over again um, at 9 a.m., and it's a repeat cycle that I'm doing. Uh, I'm about halfway through grad season at the at this point right now. Um, I will say the one big thing is about knowing your boundaries. Huge emphasis on boundaries and your balance and where you commit your time. Um, and also like optimizing on how your workflow is um, to really mitigate burnout. So currently like I do lack a lot of sleep. <laughs> um, I'm currently averaging around according to my Apple Watch, around four, five hours, which is very unhealthy. It's extremely unhealthy. Um, something that can't be long-term. This only happens seasonally. So only for a few weeks, it's like that. Um, but I will say you do have to understand your tolerance, both physically and mentally. So I have a huge tolerance where I can operate on, um, I guess you could say less than average sleep and I can still function fine. And then also knowing when to say no. I think that's probably the biggest one. So actually tomorrow I actually cancel the shoot. So, so I can at least catch up on some rest. So I'm done with the day at five, I'm not shooting until uh, eight o'clock or whatever the sun sets and I'm not editing tomorrow. And then, um, yeah, that's probably like a big thing when it comes to like navigating burnout and what you want to uh, if you end up doing what a lot of people uh, overworking yourself, you have to set up boundaries and also take care of yourself. That's a huge thing. Um, sounds simple, but um, you do get lost in the grind. You do get a tunnel vision. Um, and yeah, I, I have usually have a lot of people reminding me to take care of myself. And yeah, so those are probably some of the biggest things that I would say and advise people to do when it comes to navigating burnout and in their career and their industry as well. Do you find that like a lot of people are like have been understanding about your burnout? Like you yeah. canceled the shoot. Like what I guess like what was 
So yeah, usually, um, because most people know me for one thing or the other, but not both. Mm. So most people at tech, um, like Melanie knows me for both. But if you ever see me publicly at tech, a lot of people know me as the guy shooting the grad photos, but they don't know that I do, uh, you know, a full time uh, tech job. Mm -hmm. um, most people have been understanding, but you have to get your point across of how of like what you, of um, of what's going on with burnout, because a lot of people see it as like a kind of like a cheapskate way to kind of get out of a shoot. But um, if you get, you have to like make sure you get your value and make sure you get your point across. Um, I've, I told my boss about this. He totally understands, kind of set boundaries at work right at now at the moment for the next few weeks. And then the graduates who I'm shooting, I haven't had an issue with them saying, hey, I'm a few minutes behind because I was late for a work meeting or, hey, your photos won't be ready for another like day just because I'm trying to catch up on some rest. Um, so setting boundaries is something pretty important. Um, you don't want work to control your life. You just want to become a part of you, but not your identity. And yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I think that's good advice. And then Kevin, I saw that you unmuted yourself. So I'm, I'm just going to deem you next. Yeah, I was trying to cut him line in front of Chris. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Um, burnout, navigating burnout. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of um, details, just in case um, someone is not familiar with what an occupational therapist does. Um, so an occupational therapist's job is to help whoever they're working with um, be as independent and functional as they can. Um, so when you're working with younger children, oftentimes you are working on things um, like their um, emotional regulation in the classroom, their attention, things like their handwriting. Um, I like to use this little joke that if you guys remember from elementary school, sometimes like someone knock on the door and be like, hey, you know, like Chris, like can you come with me for a little bit? Um, so that was kind of like my role back when I was working with younger children. I also worked in a clinic um, in Arlington where uh, we had a lot of kids um, come in with a uh, kind of like musculoskeletal um, conditions, um, things like that. We would work on helping them strengthen. Um, likewise with um, a lot of times when you see adults um, in midlife around like 40s, 50s, um, they often come in for, um, you know, different injuries they experience. It could be brain injuries, spinal cord injuries. Um, it could be hand injuries too. Some like things like we got a lot of like carpal tunnel, um, things of that sort. And then later in life, um, you're looking at things like a post-stroke, um, dementia. I have, I've got a couple of folks right now with dementia, um, you know, things like uh, complications from past uh, medical conditions like cancer, um, things like that. Um, but anyways, we work on figuring out how to make them or how to help them be functional, whether that's um, just taking care of themselves um, for things like, you know, how do you take a shower again? How do you get dressed again? How do you make your food again? How do you manage your bank account? Things like that, um, whatever you need to do on your own. Um, but the nice, I want to say one of the nice things about this field is that um, because you come out of school and you're trained as a, gen a generalist, um, you have the ability to, as long as you know what the therapy is intended to do, which is to help them be um, as independent as possible, you can pretty much bounce around from um, whatever age group um, you feel, you know, not like you can bounce on bounce around anytime you feel like it, but you know, um, whenever you feel, whenever you feel like you're ready for a change. Um, I worked with kids um, two years ago, now I'm working with adults. Um, and then, so feeling burnout in this industry um, definitely happens. I, I've had a couple of coworkers go from being therapists to now working as um, UX designers. Um, I was also pretty interested in UX design at one point too. Um, I had another person go to Salesforce and, you know, a lot of times things like this happen and it's just, um, you know, it gets a little complicated when you talk about how um, healthcare is like in America. Um, you guys can ask me that like uh, separately, you guys want to go a little bit deeper into that. Um, but I think to what Chris said, being okay, saying no to things when someone asks you, Hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Of course you want to be nice and you want to be a good employee and you want to say, yeah, you know, I'll do that. I'll, you know, I'll do this. I'll do whatever it takes. Um, but at some point, you do have to do a little bit of limit setting, um, setting up boundaries, and kind of knowing, you know, what can I do efficiently, and then what can I learn, and then what might take a little bit more time. Um, and I think a part of it too is also who you surround yourself with um, at work. If you are always around folks that um, 
have a similar mindset of you. And I kind of talked about this earlier too, you know, being um, an officer and stuff. If you're always surrounding um, yourself with people who are a little too like-minded um, and kind of give you the answers you want, say yes. And let's say you're having like a bad day at work and they just go and um, kind of, you know, just go off what you said. Then you guys just kind of spiral down to like saying all these bad things about your boss and whatever. Um, I mean, things like that happen at work and it happens in every line of job. Um, but you want to also just make sure that uh, you know, whatever you're putting, you know, whatever you're putting your end time energy towards, especially since you're spending 40, 50 hours of work on um, a week, that your time is being spent wisely. You don't want to be in a predicament where, um, you know, just day in, day out, you find yourself talking, complaining about the same old things. And usually, um, that just tells you all you need to know. And it's, you know, it's time to move on and it's okay because, um, you don't want to be, um, looking a few years like down the road and kind of thinking, man, you know, I should have done this. I should have put it faster. Um, if you're in a position where um, you can make a pivot or, you know, you can make a job switch um, and then, you know, kind of everything around you, it's okay. You know, like stability in your family life, financials, where you live, et cetera. If you feel like you're okay making some sort of switch, um, I suggest go ahead and doing so. Um, I, you know, I want to say that in my line of work, I work with a lot of folks who are in their 80s and 90s, um, you know, former veterans, um, served in World War II, Vietnam, um, all those things. And then so one of the new things I've noticed from um, the current college generation um, to the folks a little bit closer to the 80s and 90s is that, um, you know, you people take care of themselves a lot more um, nowadays. You know, you're kind of quick, you're quicker to call out things that you kind of see. Um, yes, there is a little bit of loyalty, but I think the mindset of uh, a couple of folks I know who are older, um, you know, in their like 90s and stuff is that you don't have to put up with, you know, the same crummy stuff day in and day out just because um, it's a job and you're loyal, you know, speak out um, because, you know, if you don't stand for what you believe in, you'll fall for anything. So that's the way I see it. I guess to backtrack a little, I thought it was interesting too, you brought up the pivoting, career pivoting, or like, I didn't phrase that right, but like pivoting in your career. So I thought that was interesting because yeah, that, I feel like that's not talked about often either. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And if you guys have any questions about, you know, how you pivot as like a therapist or something, um, feel free to just like ask me after um, the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, we, we will try to open up. If we have time left, we'll try to open up to who's who's in the attendees section if they have any questions. But um, Uncle Rudy, what is your advice on burnout? Or how are you yeah, now well, burnout? I pretty much second what Chris and uh, Kevin have stated already. I mean, you need, you need to have a balance between your work life and your uh, personal, um, you know, find activities outside of work that will help you recharge your batteries and just totally disconnect your brain from any work thoughts or ideas. So that's, uh, yeah, you don't want work to be all consuming because it uh, it's not good for your uh, mental health for sure. But yeah, find a balance. You know, for me, it was, you know, I started uh, racing cars and that kind of helped me with my job tried to forget everything that was going on because you know you're driving a car at a pretty good clip and you know you don't want to hurt yourself so it was that was a good way for me to to hand, handle the stress and avoid burnout sorry i was muted okay it actually yeah it dawned on me that yes you you are the one with a family here out of all of us young single people <laughs> So, yeah, I think that question was really important to ask you. I started um, racing when my, uh, well, when Dante was born, my second. So I, I wasn't around a lot, but that was my, that was my therapy uh, to get through life. It was fun. You, you know, you make friends doing it. And so work is totally off of your mind. Right. I definitely feel like if you enjoy what you're doing, um, you don't feel as burnt out. And if you have hobbies, you don't feel as burnt out because you're distracting yourself with some kind of outlet. Yeah, me and Charlene <laughs> are always 
finding ways to cope with hobbies together. New hobbies. We try something new like every single <laughs> every single week. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, just time check. It's eight twenty seven. So we'll try to we'll try to wrap this up really soon. You think I should ask one more question, or should I? I think. Do you think? I think we can do one more question. Okay, cool. <laughs> so last question of tonight then. Uh, what was your experience like as an Asian American student at Virginia Tech and how do you think it compares to your experience in the workplace? Rudy, would you like to go first? Yeah, I had a great experience. You know, I was, uh, before this webinar started, I, you know, I was reminiscing that I remember, I think there were three of us in our mechanical engineering class you know, of Asian Americans and I don't know what it's like today, but, uh, you know, I don't recall, you know, just having any, uh, having it impact my career at all. I, for one, I, I think it helped me because people remember, remember who I was, because, you know, of course I look a little different, but uh, yeah, it was a positive experience and uh, it's, a, I, yeah, nothing bad has ever happened in my career because of it. That's good to hear. I feel like I'm recognized a lot because of my name. It's a different name, I guess. So I second that. Kevin, would you like to answer next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, similar to Rudy, I think, um, you know, as an Asian American, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll take you back to my one of my first examples. At my first job, um, it was me and my mentor. We were the only two Asian people um, at our company, about 30 therapists. Um, you look at like the roster uh, for the company and it's like, I was the only male working there. Um, I was also, the, I mean, I was the only Asian male. I stuck like a sore thumb. So you look at the roster, you see a bunch of blonde ladies and you know, like me in there and you're like, whoa, okay. That's a little different. Um, but you know, I think at my current job right now, um, like I said, a lot of my folks, um, you know, they were around in a time where there are not too many Asian people um, in America. And, you know, a lot of their perceptions back then of, you know, what Asian people were, you know, what kind of roles they were, what kind of like, like, I, I have a couple of people that, you know, remember Asian people moving into their neighborhood. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, my times, like a lot of times my worldview is that Asian people have always been around. Um, I, I kind of started thinking, you know, like um, being born in like the 90s and um, being, um, you know, like first generation college student, I feel like sometimes I like to joke with like my friends and my clients that, you know, Asians and Asian Americans or Vietnamese Americans, we didn't really start until like, you know, the 80s and you know, 70s when, you know, our folks like came over here. Um, so sometimes you feel like you're neither um, fully Viet, sometimes you feel like you're neither fully American, you're kind of just in between. But I think um, at my job specifically, a lot of times we'll ask, people will ask me about, you know, my upbringing, they'll ask me, you know, are you from China, are you from Korea, are you, you know, are you from Vietnam, you know, um, and of course, you know, people are going to be like, oh, you know, like, I love, like, oh, I love Bummy, I get that all the time, right, um, and, you know, I think when I first, like, started my career, um, you know, it, it will bother me a little bit, um, of course, right, just being honest, but I think over time when I started kind of understanding my clients a little bit, especially when they, you know, when I found out, you know, they were around when America or when Asian people first started into the neighbor, first started moving into their neighborhoods, um, a lot of what they were asking me and the way they talked, um, it was just kind of out of genuine curiosity. Um, because I mean, like, you, like I said, like, if you surround yourself with the same people all day long, um, you know, you don't really kind of expand outside of your walls a little bit. So um, I'm always very happy. Um, I mean, nowadays, right? I haven't had, I haven't had too many racist people recently, but um, I'm happy nowadays when people ask me about it because I always see it as an opportunity to kind of share my experiences, um, especially when um, I work in Northern Virginia and I have, I have a couple of folks who are former Hokies. So they always love to connect. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a great thing about the Virginia Tech community is that no matter, no matter where you go, or no matter where I've gone, I was in, I was in London like last week, and then I got on the train and someone recognized my VT backpack, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, like you're a hokey. Um, But you know, you never know how far and wide um, the Virginia Tech community is. So I think that, um, you know, being an Asian American coming from the VT community, it's definitely helped, um, you know, me just. 
be happy in my job and be happy answering some questions people have about being Vietnamese. Um, but yeah. Right, that's so funny. Whenever I tell people I'm Filipino, they're always like, oh yeah, lumpia, I love lumpia. Or like, pancit, you make pancit. <laughs> but you know, it, it, is, uh, it is not like derogatory or anything, it's not negative. People are really are curious or they, you know, they like to learn more about different people's cultures. You know, I don't know anything about, like, I don't know every other culture, you know, like you have to learn, you have to continually learn. <laughs> um, Chris, would you like to go next? Yeah, so kind of writing off what Kevin said, the community, uh, the Asian American community at Tech has been good to me, especially coming from my background. Um, my background is a little bit, bit unconventional for an Asian American in the United States. I was born in a small country town in the middle of Texas. I was the first Asian American to graduate from my high school, the only Asian American in the Tri-County area. Everything I did at high school, I was the first Asian to do it, everything. And then I did actually did not meet a like, fellow Asian American like as a classmate until I got to college um, at the University of Texas. And still it was very minimal. Um, the only reason I had classes like Asians in my classes or like met a lot of Asians was through college. And so up to that point, I didn't really know how to interact with other Asian Americans because um, I didn't have it growing up in my childhood. Or, and so I couldn't really relate. Like, I didn't know it was comfortable to talk about like the Asian American struggles, you know, first generation, you know, parents worked hard when they came here to the United States, you know, many things like that. And especially with family and then, um, I always kept that to myself growing up. And then, especially at the University of Texas, I kept it really to myself since it was huge uh, city school. It's a huge city school. You're in a massive city. There's so many um, people of diverse backgrounds around you. When I came to tech, I um, decided to join the Asian North because I really wanted to make more genuine Asian American friends. And um, I learned that it was very, it's kind of more, I guess, say, acceptable to like talk about those issues that only exist in the Asian American community. Um, and then talk about my experiences. It's very like unorthodox, very non-normal for um, like Asian Americans. Cause usually we tend to stay together because we have that huge community aspect, but I didn't, I didn't grow up with that. All I grew up with is my, my brother, my mom and dad's the only Asians in my life, along with just my extended family who live over back in Asia. So like the, the the tech community has really shown me that, you know, that's, though the Asian American tech community at Virginia Tech has really shown me that it's really acceptable to be talking about like these issues that we have. And I'm really glad because they're, they were the first genuine Asian American friend that I made outside of uh, what you call it, like my family. Um, at Texas, I was a huge like homebody, just academic student didn't really focus on like branching out or meeting up with like new friends so when I came to tech I decided to like reinvent myself so the community here has really been very catering to me in my college experience and shaping who I am as an Asian American still trying to navigate through life and young adulthood right now to this day um, and yeah it's been it's been really good to me uh, Melanie has been a good person to help me through my through my issues in life and yeah Great. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so sorry to keep you guys over the, you know, time frame that I had mentioned, but um, that concludes our career panel. <laughs> Let me share my screen real quick. Uh, okay. So <laughs> thank you panelists for being, um, for taking time out of your day to share your experiences. It was a pleasure learning about you all and we hope to keep in touch. We also encourage any students with us tonight to reach out to our wonderful alumni if they have any questions. Here are their emails. <laughs> and quick announcement, we'll be back at Virginia Tech on May 12th at 5.30 for the achievement ceremony. The ceremony is in the GLC auditorium and the reception to follow is in the multi-purpose room. Nina or Jackie, do you have anything else to add? 
Um, no, except just thank you so much for doing this. I know it's a busy time of the year, um, semester-wise for students, but also just busy time for everybody these days. So really, really appreciate it. And um, I hope to see some of the alumni Hokies back for all of the different APITAS events in the future. And thank you again. And it was great to learn more about you and to meet you virtually, at least. So thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Happy Apidum. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time and for hosting all this. Thanks, Charlene. Thanks, EJ, for having me. You did a great, uh, great job here. Yeah, thanks, guys, for organizing um, the seminar. I think uh, tonight was a really good time. I'm glad to meet all of you guys. Thanks. <laughs> I'm actually putting the link for the face Apidum's Facebook. Mind you, I'm membership chair. So if any of you guys on the panel and in the attendees, if you're interested in getting to know Apitas more, just let me know. There's no dues. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice membership deal right. if, if you ask me, but yeah. Right. Sorry, Charlene, going. Oh, no, that's all I have. Oh, okay. <laughs> Follow Thank us on Instagram, add us on Facebook. <laughs> All right, Take it easy. Thank you guys.